Hello, it's Paul from the Garland County Library, and I'm here live with Judy Deer, who is the Garland County Master Gardener's Know What to Grow It chairperson. We're here Good with evening, you. everyone. How are you? Do Hot. Well. <laughs> yes, and we are here for our latest monthly program, and if you've missed any previous episodes, you can watch the recordings of those live here on the library's Facebook channel or YouTube, whichever one you're watching on. Uh, all the previous episodes are listed there and this one will be too if, if you end up missing part of it or want to share it later uh, we appreciate that so um what, what are we tuning into tonight judy i know this uh flyer is pretty intriguing and amazing come for the river stay for the star yes i'll tell you um i'm probably gonna blow a little bit of my intro but uh casey johansson is a is a park ranger at buffalo national river and I saw that she was going to be speaking at our, our uh, statewide Master Gardener Convention on light pollution and how it affects all kinds of things, including us, but critters and bugs and all kinds of things that we really should be worried about. And everybody seems to want to put up big lights on the lake now. I live on the lake and it's all lit up and, you know, I've, I've lost some of my bats. And so... When I saw Casey was going to speak, I'm like, wow, I really want to get her. So I, I called her and she said, sure. And then I saw her speak at the convention and it's just a great um, presentation and very, very interesting. And I know she's going to tell you some, uh, everybody, some great things about um, what the Buffalo National River means to not only Arkansas, but the but America, but, but the world, I mean, it's one of the few places. So anyway, I won't, I won't steal her thunder, but uh, so it's really going to be a great program and we do have a special guest. So. Excellent. And you'll tell us all about our special guest in just a moment, but everyone watching live, as always, we encourage you to give your feedback and ask questions if you have them. And uh, we're going to do the prizes a little differently from now on. Um, yeah. We're going to do the gift bags, but every month we are going to have a gift card to a different local uh, gardening or landscape related uh, business or organization here in Garland County. And uh, this month we're giving away a gift card to Hot Spring Sod and Turf. Yes. As I said last month, it's one of my favorite places. They've got a lot of different um, potting materials. They've got pots, trees, um, different Law, uh, well, a lot. I hate to say lawn art, but you know, uh, statues, bird baths. They've got a plethora of really great things, and I hope you go see them. I hope you win it, but go mm -hmm. see them anyway, even if you don't, because they're a great family run organization. We love them. And to win that gift card, you just have to ask a question, any question related to the topic, as long as you're nice about it. And <laughs> you could be given a, you could, you, one of you will win the card before the program is over um, after the presentation will ask yeah, after the presentation paul does this this random generator thing so anyone who's asked a question you, you put your name in this list and it it juggles them all around and then comes up with one winner and helen asked at the end and you can always pick up your prize at the garland county library circulation desk so it'll be ready for you tomorrow that's right happy shopping all right. Well, I am going to turn it over to you. Uh, All right. Let you do your introduction. So thanks, I'll Judy. Take it. Well, I've already said welcome to Know to Grow It, and I'm happy y'all are here. And what a change a few weeks makes. I'll tell you, the heat is incredible. And I hope when you're outside working, you remember to drink plenty of fluids and take breaks often, because that's what I am doing. Uh, as Paul announced, we're ending our gift bag giveaway, but it was great fun. And and all all good things come to an end and especially if they're replaced by better things so the gift cards are going to be more fun and you can pick it up at the garland county circulation desk if you're the winner and you can pick it up tomorrow uh, please come by and visit us at the ask a master gardener booth at the saturday farmer market we have handouts on how to grow seasonal veggies and knowledgeable master gardeners to answer your questions and if we can't answer your question, we will give you um, some information on how to find that that the answer to your question. You know, I've been having a terrible trouble with my tomatoes. And uh, another thing that the Extension Service does for us is they have a plant scientist, a biologist, that you can actually send a plant to and they will come back and let you know what's going on with your plant. 
All you have to do is take your plant, your specimen plant in a bag and take it down to the extension office at 236 Woodbine and they will send it off to the pathologist who will come back with what your problem is. Now, next month, Note to Grow It will present our third segment of Homesteading in a Modern World with Jamie Wilkerson. And she's gotten us through an introduction to homesteading, garden, plant, garden prep and plant propagation, hard to say. And next month, we'll discuss how to preserve your harvest. So please join us on the third Wednesday of July, which is July 20th at 6 p.m. for this great program. Now we have a special guest, Rachel Keeling, who is with the City of Hot Springs Stormwater Division, has a special announcement for a fun family event. And so I'd like to bring Rachel Keeling on. Hi, good night, everybody. As you stated, I do have an announcement to make. We, the City of Springs Storm Edition, along with the are holding our first Rain Barrel Workshop. This is a free, family friendly event that is happening on Saturday, June 25th from 10 to 11. We are going to do a little bit of education, um, show you the importance of rain barrels and how they can help on your in your home. And then we're going to do a demonstration on how to make your own. And at the end, we're actually going to let the kids through there paint the rain barrel. That will be the extension service office after we're done being put to good use. It is at Family Park. Page 25th. If you have any questions on this flyer, um, please give me a call or send me an email if you have any questions. And we look forward to seeing everybody there. Rachel, we, we had a little audio um, distortion going on, so I'm just going to repeat one thing. Uh, the Rain Barrel Workshop is going to be at Family Park Pavilion Number 2, and that's 215 Family Park Road. Is that off Airport Road? Yes, it is. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's going to be from 10 to 11. And the kids are going to get to decorate the rain barrel at the end. And rain barrels are really a great thing to have. And I'm so glad that Rachel is promoting it. So please remember, Saturday, June 25th, 10 to 11 at Family Park off Airport Road. Thank you, Rachel. All right. All right. So now for tonight's program. Casey Johansson is a park ranger at Buffalo National River. She was slated to speak at our Master Gardener Conference, as I told you, last month on a topic I think is really important, light pollution. And I just knew we had to have her for Know It to Grow It. I so enjoyed her presentation at the conference and was excited that we had her on our agenda, and here she is tonight. Casey grew up on a small farm in rural Michigan and discovered her love for the national parks on a college service learning trip to Acadia National Park. She was fortunate enough to start her national park career at Acadia in 2003. She then moved to sunny and hot South Texas to work at Amistad National Recreation Area. In 2011, she and her husband decided to leave the desert behind and headed for the beautiful waters of Buffalo National River. Casey is thoroughly enjoying her time in the natural state and raising her son in the Ozarks. Please welcome Casey Johansson. Hey. Hey, thank you, Judy, um, for that very kind introduction. So, yeah, I, light pollution. This is um, a thing that um, perhaps not many of us um, are is in tune with as maybe we should be. So um, if nothing else tonight, I hope to just kind of educate you guys. Uh, maybe some of these things you'll be aware of. Maybe some of this will be new information. Um, please, you know, jot down your questions or comments for the end. I would uh, love to entertain those and, and maybe we can have some discussion here at the end. So let me get my slides up. Oh, all right. Here we, oops, I'm sorry. Tech, oh, slight technical difficulties here. Let me go back. All right. So uh, like Judy said, uh, my program is is uh, focused on the Buffalo River, um, but a lot of the things I'm going to talk about tonight can apply to your own communities and neighborhoods um, and places where you like to spend time. 
And so uh, come for the river, stay for the stars um, is what I titled this program because here at the Buffalo National River, most folks, I would guess 97% of the people I see on a daily basis uh, come to enjoy the beautiful free flowing uh, waters of America's first national river. And, um, and that's wonderful that they experience that river and get to make memories and enjoy that resource. Um, but I, the last few years, I've really tried to point out to folks that after the sun goes down, there is a lot of things that go on out there. Um, and so while folks are usually pretty tired out from a day on the river, um, I always encourage them if they can, you know, manage to stay awake, uh, late enough to enjoy the night sky, they'll be in for a real treat. So, like I say, the Buffalo, it is more than a river. Um, a lot of folks, again, uh, especially in the last couple of years with uh, the pandemic, um, a lot of folks have flocked to our public lands uh, as a, you know, a source of entertainment and something to do um, in, a, in a safe way. And so, like I said, a lot of folks come to float the river. There is hiking, there is camping, there is fishing and birding, um, all of those things. But parks can be uh, more than daytime recreation. Uh, you know, they're also places to find solitude and renew your spirit. And, and that can happen at night, too. Uh, here is a, a picture of the Milky Way here over the Buffalo River. Um, and it's a beautiful place to enjoy the night sky. You know, for four and a half billion years, the Earth has known this constant rotation of light and day. Um, and this cycle is what all living things exposed to it have evolved uh, to, you know, relying on this cycle. And so I think, you know, with today's modern world, it's really easy to kind of lose sight of that. Um, and so today we're going to talk about, um, you know, light pollution. What is it? Why should we even bother being concerned. Um, then we will go into, um, you know, what, what are those concerns? What are the impacts to uh, wildlife, for example? What are the impacts, like Judy said, to our own human health? Um, what about the cultural, uh, you know, the cultural dynamic to the night sky? So there are certainly reasons to be concerned. Um, and I hope that this will spark some conversation and interest down there uh, in, in Garland County uh, at the end. So let's get into it. So going dark in the park. Um, so like Judy said, I have been at Buffalo National River for 11 years now. Um, and I guess it was back in 20, the fall of 2016, the park superintendent approached me and said, hey, I've, I've got an idea for a project. Uh, I'd like to look into seeing if it would be feasible uh, to, you know, or if we could explore the idea of uh, making Buffalo National River an international dark sky park. Um, there is an organization called the International Dark Sky Association based out of Arizona, and they certify places all over the world, actually, um, based on the uh, quality of their night skies and the, the dark quality of the night sky specifically. So I thought, man, all right, it's a project. I'm down with it. Um, I, to be perfectly honest, at that point in my life thought, I mean, I guess light pollution's a thing. I'm not really sure, you know, if it rates very high on my list of things I think the world should care about, but, uh, you know, I'll take a stab at it. And throughout that process, I learned that, um, that, well, there was a lot of steps to that process and it was, it took several years, uh, over three years for us to actually get through the process through the International Dark Sky Association. So it's not necessarily an easy feat uh, to, to get that uh, designation, which we were able to finally get in 2019. Um, but we had to really make a commitment ourselves. And so that first commitment was going around the park to see exactly what our own light uh, footprint was. And you might think, especially if you've been to the Buffalo River, you might think, you know, how many how many lights are we really talking about? It's mostly campgrounds um, and in rural areas or remote area uh, areas to access the river. Well, I found that river wide uh, we had between 300 and 350 light fixtures that needed to be addressed. Um, so first of all, you know, made an inventory of what we had and, um, and really learned a lot about how we could take our own, um, impact on the night sky and dial it down a couple of notches. Um, and so that meant 
you know, researching new fixtures. That meant researching new bulbs. And I'll talk about some of that later and what all that entailed. Uh, that meant looking at motion sensor use and timers um, and just really being more cognizant of what we were doing after dark. To be perfectly honest, most park employees aren't around uh, in the evening hours. And so for me to spend some time out there after dark was really eye-opening in terms of the energy uh, use and, and waste that was going on in the park. So, so that, was a, that was a piece of the project. Another piece of the project was to uh, physically monitor the darkness of the night sky. And so they do make sky quality meters, um, which I knew nothing about before this came about. Um, but they make these instruments that you are able to take out at night on a cloudless, moonless night. And uh, it'll, it'll give you a reading. And so you're able to, to look at a scale and see, well, how do par parts of the park uh, rate as far as, you know, compared to, you know, places out west and such. And so uh, if you've been to the Buffalo National River, you know, we are a very linear, geographically spread out park. Um, and so certainly there are places that were more darker than others. Uh, there are some wilderness areas out there. Um, and so we were able to find some areas that we thought, yeah, we really can compete with some of those parks out West in terms of, uh, the darkness, uh, level in our night skies on a, a moonless night. So we did monitoring, uh, pretty much, it was pretty continual, uh, for, two to three years. Um, and now we're, we monitor, uh, every 15 minutes at night. So I've, I've upgraded and now we've got some solar powered, uh, sky quality meters located throughout the park that have been really, really helpful in helping us gauge and, and keep, a keep tabs on where we are in terms of, uh, true darkness. Uh, so that was one aspect of the, uh, certification process or designation process. Uh, the last thing was, um, is exactly what I'm here doing tonight, is educating the public pollution, um, making people more cognizant of what the park was doing to, um, again, lessen our own impact on the night sky, uh, what folks at home can do and in their own communities uh, to, to maybe make little, little differences and impacts. Um, and so starting in uh, 2018, I believe, we started offering night sky programs uh, specifically at Buffalo Point. Um, and while there was a small break during COVID, uh, we have res we uh, started those up again last summer. And for those of you that are interested in the night sky, uh, check our website and our calendar of events uh, because myself and, and one other ranger offer night sky programs uh, from Memorial Day through Labor Day every every weekend, pretty much. So um, so anyway, we are we are getting into schools. Master Gardeners are always a, a great group to, to touch base with, too, on this topic. So that's been a really, really positive aspect of this whole program. Uh, but like I said, I'm the first to admit that when the superintendent first approached me, I thought, huh, light pollution, I guess. Is it really a big thing? And, and now I tell people, you know, uh, I can't even drive around with my family at night without being annoyed by the sheer amount of lights in, in the communities I uh, live near. Uh, because to me, I'm like, gosh, I just don't know if we're putting light where we need it uh, in an effective way uh, necessarily. So uh, this picture here um, looks probably really black on your screen, and that's a good thing. Uh, this is a picture from uh, an access point called South Maumee in the park. And so um, it it's really great because you can uh, tell where the words Marshall and the uh, St. Joe are in Western Grove. Uh, those are small communities in the area. Um, and thankfully, we're not seeing a lot of uh, light coming from those areas. So uh, the Buffalo is, is a fantastic place to view the night sky from. So like I said, light pollution, what, what is it exactly? Well, it's simply the brightening of the night sky caused by street lights or other man-made sources which has a disruptive effect on natural cycles and inhibits the observation of stars and planets. So it may not even be apparent to a lot of folks that they're living with light pollution until they visit uh, a place that's got a, a, a more you know pristine night sky. Um, and so again, if you live near an urban area, hot springs, Little Rock, uh, those areas, you may not even realize what you're missing. Um, and so here is the a picture of uh, various various types of night sky that you may have. Um, everything from an inner city sky, which 
is pretty much just a dark blue or gray uh, scene over the over the city with without any stars showing. Um, as you move towards the suburban and the rural sky, stars will start to pop out more. There's less light uh, that's that's uh, kind of you know putting a veil over your view, and then it goes to the excellent dark sky uh, aspect over there as well. Um, so let's get into some more specifics about that. Uh, this this uh, scene here shows the Bortle scale. The Bortle scale is a nine tiered um, a nine tier scale, which really puts us all on the same playing field because. What's dark to Judy um, at her house may not be dark to me or vice versa. And so to kind of level that out and to put us all on the on an even scale, uh, D John Bortle developed this uh, really easy to use scale on what you uh, may see over your head uh, on a clear moonless uh, night. And so I hope none of you guys are in the seven, eight, nine category. Um, you know, again, that's more of an inner city um, kind of night sky where the brightest planets are really going to be about what you can see um, and, and maybe a, just a handful of the really brightest stars up there. As you transition down to the, the one, two, three uh, levels of the Bortle scale, you are getting uh, great glimpses of the Milky Way. You're probably seeing roughly 2000 stars. Uh, on any given night uh, under a, a one, two, or three. Um, and so the Buffalo River, uh, our darkest readings come from an area called Boxley Valley um, on the western end of the park. And so uh, that valley has, has given us some really dark readings and puts us uh, at a, a very comfortable two uh, level. And so uh, that is what you can expect uh, at the upper end of the Buffalo River. So back to light pollution, where does it come from? Well, like I said, it's it's all us. Um, I highly doubt, uh, while Thomas Edison may not have invented the light bulb, he really made it popular and put it, uh, helped propel it into our everyday use. I highly doubt he could have ever foreseen the impacts that lighting up our night would eventually have on us. Um, while it's super great that we can partake in recreational activities at night, Maybe not so great for some folks that work second shift and are able to extend their work day or, or even third shift. Um, those are all things that came about because we were able to light our night. So uh, we partake in a lot of different activities that our you know, ancestors and even great great grandparents were, weren't necessarily able to partake in. Uh, so specifically, we've got light pollution coming from all sorts of sources at night. We've got headlights, of course. We've got street lamps. Lots of those around. Um, when I say houses, um, I'm talking specifically about what I would call um, like landscape lighting or show off lighting. So those lights that people put in the front of their yards sometimes to kind of illuminate the outside of their homes. Um, businesses sure pump out a lot of light at night, uh, specifically gas stations or, or other businesses that are trying to attract you. Um, in cities, you've got, you know, big old office buildings that may be lit up at night. Um, around really big urban areas, um, you've got the neon signs. I don't live too terribly far from Branson, and so uh, there is certainly some light pollution uh, coming off of the strip there at Branson. Billboards, same deal. So a lot of these sources uh, that I have listed are pointing light directly up and scattering it into the atmosphere which is that scattering is what causes that veil uh, to, you know, over our, over our stars and our naturally dark, uh, dark night there. So here is a map of the country. Um, you guys may have seen a, a map like this before, but as seen from well above uh, the country or the planet, um, it's really easy to pick out all of our urban areas, right? So you can pick out Chicago there on Lake Michigan, Detroit, um, all of the big cities along the I-95 corridor on the East Coast, you got, you know, Baltimore, DC, uh, New York City, all of that is, is pretty easy to pick out. Um, out West, the coast of California is pretty lit up. Looking up into Oregon and Washington, same thing. 
Um, and so it, you might think like, golly, it's, we are really doing a number on our landscape and, and you'd be right. We are. Um, but where that red circle is on the map, that is a very, very small area here in the Ozarks, um, that still has skies that are comparable to some of those that are out West. And so, um, you know, I consider us again, very lucky at Buffalo National River to be able to offer uh, dark night skies to the folks that want to come and enjoy their public lands. So we've got this kind of little fragmented island uh, right where we're at. Here is just a picture of sky glow. So again, all that illumination and that upwelling just going up into the atmosphere. Um, I won't talk too much about uh, real specific uh, specifics on the light spectrum, but uh, do know that, you know, light comes in a variety of colors. And that real bright white light, um, that daytime uh, light, that, that falls to the, the blue end of the spectrum. And blue light scatters uh, very easily in the atmosphere, but easier than colors like amber or red. And so uh, scenes like this taken from an airplane, you know, if you've ever flown at night, it's pretty, again, going back to that map I just showed you, it's pretty easy to pick out every community um, down below. And it's again, just simply because of largely street lights, uh, in, in the night that are throwing the light upward. So in this slide, um, I want you to take a look at these two pictures. These pictures are of the same house. Uh, this house is located about 45 minutes from Toronto, Ontario. And this, uh, this picture, um, the one where the house is lit up with a kind of a pinkish orangey uh, hazed sky above it, uh, that is what that house looked, that is what the night sky rather over that house looks like on an average night uh, outside of Toronto. Uh, the other picture, the picture where you can just see the windows illuminated, uh, I think they're actually illuminated by candlelight, uh, that picture was taken uh, when uh, there was a wide scale power outage in the Toronto area. And so it's wild to see, I'm sure, especially for these homeowners, what exactly they're missing every night uh, because of the lights of, of Toronto behind their house. Um, and so pretty significant difference uh, in that picture. You can see they've got the Milky Way uh, straight over their house. Um, and again, it's just it's quite the contrast to see what a difference turning off the lights makes. Uh, similarly, I've read of a, a story uh, that I always like to share because while funny, um, I do find it slightly tragic that in 1994, uh, there was an earthquake in LA. And so this earthquake <clears throat> knocked out power to the city. And uh, when that happened, of course, uh, you know, I think folks naturally probably gravitate outside during an earthquake or, or thereafter uh, waiting for the aftershocks. And so that evening uh, with this large scale power outage going on, folks started noticing something weird in the sky and the emergency centers in LA were getting calls from people who were very concerned about what they described as a silvery uh, cloud over the city. And I say it's a funny story because what they were seeing and they what they had probably a lot of them had never really recognized before was the Milky Way. Um, and so it's uh, it's just crazy to think that that it was a it was a phenomenon, for lack of a better word, uh, that really, really concerned and stood out to them. Um, but they're just not used to, to seeing uh, the night sky like that. Uh, it. Scientists estimate that uh, nowadays a third of people worldwide are no longer able to see the Milky Way uh, from their homes. Here in America, that statistic goes up to a staggering 80% of folks that can no longer see the Milky Way uh, from the comfort of their backyards. Uh, I live in a pretty small town uh, just outside of the Buffalo River watershed, and even for me in town, it's a struggle. So. Um, and again, I, I think it's mostly due to streetlights uh, that are in my community. So um, definitely, you know, if you've got a, a really pristine dark night sky um, above your head at night, count yourself lucky because most of us don't have that. So now that I've talked about what light pollution is and shown you some examples of what it looks like, 
um, why should you care? Why, why does this matter to, to, to us? Well, for starters, uh, it's simply a waste of energy and money to, to pay for things that are literally just going up in the air and not pointing at what we need uh, necessarily. Um, we're going to talk about the effects uh, and the impacts to wildlife. It's also been uh, studies have shown the harmful effects to our own human health. And again, like I stated uh, in the first slide or two, you know, there is a shared cultural heritage. Um, again, going back to our ancestors, we're not seeing the same sky that they did. Um, even again, grandparents, great grandparents, we're not able to, for most of us, we're not seeing the same night sky that they did. And uh, I'd like to think that, that my kiddo can grow up in a place where, you know, you're able to enjoy that and, and partake in that. Um, the night sky is something that transcends cultures. It, trans it should transcend time. It's something that connects us all as humans. And so uh, there definitely is a cultural uh, aspect to all of this. So first, let's talk about the impacts to wildlife. Um, there are, there are plenty of animals that are impacted. I'm just going to touch on, uh, three or four here. Um, but for starters, uh, birds are heavily impacted. Um, research has found that, you know, a lot of birds, you know, of course, migrate at night. Uh, they, their natural instincts tell them to use the stars and the moon to navigate by. It's really distracting to them, uh, when they get close to a, a big city that's on their flyway. And that light may draw them in. They may confuse it for the moon. Um, and when they get into big urban areas with skyscrapers and communication towers and things, uh, th those kinds of interactions can be really tragic for bird populations. Um, and so the Audubon Society, I know, makes rough estimates. I mean, they estimate millions of birds every year uh, collide needlessly uh, because they're distracted and they're off course. The night sky also uh, gives them, you know, cues on not only migration, but uh, certain behaviors, you know, mating, foraging, um, you know, when they, uh, you know, in, in terms of when it's time to raise their young and all of that. And so a night sky that's impacted by by lights can throw those behave those natural behaviors off. Um, the picture at the bottom there. Uh, are, is a picture of baby sea turtles. So I know we don't, most of us uh, here probably like to visit the beach, but we don't live by the beach. Um, but despite that, I think a lot of us probably still care about wildlife that's not necessarily uh, right in our, in our own neighborhoods or communities. Um, sea turtles, for example, uh, well, mama sea turtles, first of all, they obviously need a beach to, to, lay, to make their nest and lay their eggs. Um, and it's been found that female sea turtles are deterred uh, from coming to beaches that are lit up. Once they find a beach that's suitable, um, though in those those baby eggs hatch, those little sea turtles dig themselves out, and their natural instinct tells them head for the water. Um, and how do they know where the water is? Well, they're looking for the reflection of the moon on the water. They are naturally drawn to light when they hatch. And so if you've got a big community behind the dunes that's all lit up, um, it is certainly possible for those sea turtles to get pretty disoriented. Uh, turtles in general don't have a great success rate. Uh, mamas have to lay a lot of eggs in their lifetime uh, to hope that just a couple of them make it uh, to adulthood. And so with that being said, it's hard enough to be a baby sea turtle. And uh, so, you know, it's really unfortunate when we think about the fact that humans um, may be impacting their survival rate even more uh, when it's already a pretty tough world for these little guys to get started in. Um, for a, uh, a critter that's near and dear to my heart personally, um, that picture next to the birds may be hard to tell what that is, um, but those are streaks from fireflies in the night sky. And uh, I know when I moved here, um, and especially raising a six-year-old now, we live for summer nights when we can go outside and net a bunch of fireflies and look at them and, and then kindly release them later. Uh, but that's been so much fun for me when I was a child and, and now raising my own and, and seeing kids down at the buffalo uh, in awe of the fireflies at night. But scientists have found that um, in the presence of, of man-made light, um, 
female fireflies are less communicative with the male fireflies. Um, they flash as a way to communicate with one another. Well, again, when, uh, when man-made light is brought into uh, their environment, uh, the females are less likely to flash back to the males, which scientists have found leads to less mating and obviously reproduction. Um, and so for me, that's a, that's a bummer. I don't want, uh, I don't want kiddos to miss out on the joys of fireflies at night in their backyard. Um, again, that's something we should all get to, to enjoy and, and make memories doing. Um, but, you know, just even something as tiny as a, as an insect, uh, can definitely be impacted, which, uh, brings me to my next point. Um, I know a lot of you guys are master gardeners and I'm sure that pollination is, something that you're uh, all well and well and familiar with. Um, and of course, you know, we know bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, those are our, our daytime pollinators and they are vital uh, to our uh, to our gardens and to our food production. Again, about a third of a one out of th every three bites that you take uh, is dependent upon some something pollinating it. Um, but what I've learned throughout this process of learning about light pollution is that there is a whole other aspect of pollination um, that I wasn't familiar with, at least until a couple of years ago. Um, there's this night shift out there. There are, there are uh, you know, bats, not, not here in the Ozarks, but there are bats that pollinate. Uh, there are beetles. They're a really important pollinator. Mosquitoes, moths, even flies. Um, and so... Those insects all help us uh, with food production and they uh, only pollinate under the cover of night. And you may think, well, what's the big deal if there's some yard lights or street lights on? Is that really a big deal to a moth or to a, a beetle? Well, I think we can all picture scenes in our head where there's a, a bright yard light on and all the moths and the insects circling it, right? Um, and so when that happens, um, a, the insects are being drawn away from what they should be doing. Um, so they're wasting time and energy being drawn to lights. Um, and then also you're kind in a way, uh, bright lights at night can really create some interesting, uh, food, food chain ramifications. So if you've got a light that's drawn all these insects to it, uh, they certainly become easy prey for bats or frogs or, or whatever else may be hunting them at night. And so, um, again, just just knowing that insects, uh, you know, need the cover of, of a natural night sky to do their job is pretty interesting to me. And so then uh, there are the impacts to our own human health that lights at night have. So. We all know that sitting under really bright uh, lights at night uh, stimulates our, our system. Uh, it's usually harder to fall asleep for folks. Um, and so especially with the devices that we have now in our homes, whether it's television or our, our tablets or computers or what have you, um, our daily in our daily lives, we are bombarded uh, with, with that bright white light. Um, and so, you know, again, like I said before, everything on this earth for, again, four and a half billion years has really evolved with this cycle of light and dark. And our circadian rhythm, uh, that internal biological clock that we all have, is in tune with this cycle of light and dark. Um, but when we expose ourselves to light and prolong, prolong our day into the evening, we do mess with our own internal systems. So, our circadian rhythm, again, you know, it determines and regulates our sleep schedules. So that's vital to uh, having healthy immune systems. Um, our circadian rhythm is directly um, attached to our melatonin levels. And when we, uh, when we alter our own circadian rhythm, melatonin levels can be suppressed. Um, and that's a problem. So scientists have found that uh, suppressed melatonin levels, not only are you messing with your sleep, um, but the American Medical Association has found that you can increase your risk for certain kinds of cancer, uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer. Um, you're also uh, have the potential to um, 
influence your own health in terms of increased uh, chances for depression and diabetes. Um, you're uh, regulating your blood, the regulation of your blood pressure is also uh, dependent upon a healthy circadian rhythm. And so um, all of these things, again, very vital to um, our own bodies, um, which is something that, again, I don't think I probably ever gave a thought to uh, prior to learning about light pollution. And so I know for me, one thing I've done is if I do need to be on a device at night, you know, there, I think most of them now all have a setting where you can take out the bright white light, um, which certainly helps a lot. And like I've alluded to a couple of times now, there is this shared cultural heritage. Um, and so, you know, ancient peoples used the night sky for navigation. Um, they were able to, um, you know, make their calendars. They looked to the night sky for seasonal cues. Um, different cultures, uh, cultures around the world, whether they were Chinese, um, Incan, Mayan, um, you know, Romans, they all use the night sky as cues for when they should uh, sow their, their crop, when they should harvest. Um, they use the night sky really, you know, in a lot of ways to explain things that they maybe necessarily couldn't explain any other way. Um, one, the one example I like to give is that uh, in Egypt, for example, there is a star, Sirius, the, the brightest star in the sky um, that rises, you know, same time every year. And uh, the Egyptians learned to recognize the fact that when they would see that star rise, uh, they knew that that was the season that was marking the beginning of the season for the Nile to flood, um, which was vital to, to their, their culture. Um, and so really, you know, again, they were able to, to use these cues in the night sky to really key in on, on things that were uh, maybe going to happen in their daily lives. Of course, religion uh, was a huge was a huge thing, um, and and there were a lot of connections to uh, the night sky and the gods and the goddesses, especially in the Greek and the Roman cultures. Um, but all over the world, there were these connections uh, from different enclave, enclaves of of people, and so. Um, I have not had the uh, privilege of traveling to either of these places I have in this slide. Um, but the, the picture there in New Grange, Ireland, um, that is a um, mound temple uh, that is in Ireland again, and that was built, uh, they think about 3200 uh, BC. And what's really cool about this site is that that tunnel uh, that's in the picture there that tunnel lights up for 17 minutes every winter solstice. It directly aligns with the sun. Um, and so ancient peoples, uh, they built structures. You know, of course, the Egyptians did. Uh, most of us are aware of that. Um, but even here in Ireland, they, they were building these structures that directly corresponded to what was happening in the sky at certain times of the year. And the significance of this is that... Um, there is a direct connection between burying people in this huge mound and with the uh, winter solstice, which marks the beginning of longer days every year, uh, which happens, you know, around December 21st, 22nd. Um, and it's a connection between their dead and the afterlife. Um, and so that's kind of a neat thing. And people still travel there today to take this in um, again when that tunnel fills fully with light every winter solstice. Um, Chichen Itza over here, uh, that structure in the center of that settlement, uh, El Castillo, I believe it's called, uh, that was built, uh, for, uh, religious purposes, but the fact that on each equinox, the spring equinox and the fall equinox, uh, the sun aligns in such a way that it casts shadows, uh, on that structure. And those shadows look like a serpent, uh, going up and down it. And so, again, it's it's pretty interesting uh, the way that ancient cultures were able to make these connections and and go forth and and build structures. Uh, again, these things were happening in Egypt um, as well. Stonehenge. There are there are places all over the world where ancient people were. You could tell they were heavily connected to what was going on in the in the sky above them. And even today, we have a lot of night sky references in our own cultural uh, world. And so 
I think it's fun. If you really sit back and think about it, there are a lot of, a lot of things that we reference um, that are connected to the night sky. Uh, an easy one is, you know, we call famous people, uh, those Hollywood folks, we call them stars, right? Um, why do we call them stars? Well, <clears throat> you know, they're some, they're people that we elevate kind of above ourselves. We put them up there on a different plane, you know, closer to the gods, perhaps. And so, you know, our celebrities are known as stars. Um the dog days of summer. I feel, I feel like we're there now. Um, it is hot out there, but the dog days of summer, again, uh, that, that goes back to the Egyptians. And, uh, when they would see that bright star Sirius, which is in a dog, which is in the dog constellation, when they would see that star rise, they knew they were headed for the, the heat of the year. And so, uh, kind of neat, uh, that we still, we still use these phrases in our everyday life. Um, I think it's fun to think about the foods that we have and the drinks that we drink. Um, we've got Sunkist and Corona and uh, what else? Oh, who doesn't like a Moon Pie or a Milky Way, a Starburst? Um, even Subaru uh, has its roots in the night sky. And so, again, culturally speaking, uh, we still use a lot of a lot of references to the night sky in our everyday world. So again, what does a dark night sky look like? Well, here at the Buffalo, um, if you were to come out and join me for a night sky program this summer, if you stayed up a little later than this ranger does, uh, you would be treated to a view of the Milky Way uh, directly over the river. Um, that picture there is again at Buffalo Point at the lower end of the river. Uh, that bluff, uh, <clears throat> I don't have a light shining on that bluff in, on an ordinary night uh, whatsoever, but that bluff is painted bluff. And again, like I said, you can uh, you can roughly expect to see about 2000 stars on a on a clear, dark night. Um, and so hopefully if you can't get scenes like that from your own backyard, uh, at some point you'll be able to or, or have been able to enjoy that elsewhere. So with all this being said in my preaching about light pollution and, and the impacts of it, is all outdoor lighting bad? No, I am definitely not saying that at all. Um, what, was, what was really interesting to me to learn throughout the process of the Buffalo River uh, being designated as an international dark sky park was the fact that there is a happy medium there. Um, again, the whole my whole mindset going into it was, you know, reminding myself that it's all about putting the right amount of light where you need it and when you need it. So again, you know, it's fine to have uh, our restroom facilities lit up, but is anybody typically in there at three or 4 a.m.? Probably not. So is it is it okay to put them on a motion sensor? Um, and that's what we have found that, you know, again, uh, for one, shielding lights so that light is pointed down. It's not just needlessly going into the atmosphere was huge. We spent a lot of money on fixtures that point the light directly down to where you need it. Uh, we spent a lot of time finding and researching the appropriate colored bulbs. So like I said, uh, that the really bright white light, um, daytime light sometimes is, is how it reads on the bulb boxes. But um, but light at that end of the spectrum really scatters easily. easily. Um, we have opted to go towards amber colored lights in the park, uh, both inside our restroom facilities and on the outside of the buildings, um, which is where a majority of our of our light fixtures are located. Um, and we've really uh, while we still use LED bulbs for efficiency, we've really dropped down the wattage as well. Um, and so that's been really helpful. And then again, like I said, putting things on timers and motion sensors has been huge. Um, one funny story I like to tell or, or like to relay to folks is that when we first did this, um, you know, I knew the public would notice right away that, oh, weird, you have like yellow lights in your bathroom. And I thought, yeah. And, and some folks noticed it is kinder to your own night vision. So when you walk out of a, a facility at night into a dark setting uh, outdoors, it's easier for your eyes to adjust if you're coming from a warmer light, like an amber or a, a red colored light. Uh, so it's kinder to your own night vision. But the funny thing was, is that um, our maintenance staff found me, you know, a month or two after we had made the switch to these amber colored lights. 
And they said, you know, we have noticed that with the use of timers and the uh, the different colored light, the yellow or amber hue, um, we have much fewer bugs to sweep out of the restrooms at night. So bugs are not attracted to the lights, the, these colored lights anyway, the way they are, that bright white light. Um, and again, with the motion sensors, that really helps as well. So uh, these are all things that, you know, look, you're, you can think about uh, for use in your own home and in backyards. So again, what's our commitment? We're, we're trying to be really responsible about our own lighting. We're trying to uh, have minimal impact on the ecosystem and natural processes that need the cover of night um, in order to operate. Like I said, we're all about using timers and motion sensors uh, to activate the light only when it's needed. Um, using those fixtures uh, to point downward um, to keep the light from needlessly uh, heading off into the atmosphere. Um, you know, more light's not always better. Um, again, just being being really cognizant of what you're doing um, is, is really helpful um, in terms of a lighting strategy. And like I said, using amber or warm colored light, avoiding that cool or, or really bright blue white light is also very key. Here's some pictures um, of what we've done. Um, I mean, yes, restroom facilities for sure, but we have also made changes to our pavilions, all of our administrative, you know, our, our ranger stations, um, our law enforcement stations, all of them uh, have been outfitted with, with new lights and new fixtures over the last couple of years. So uh, that picture in the lower corner there, uh, that's very black, shows that uh, when using the appropriate fixture and the appropriate colored light, uh, we're pointing the light exactly where you need it. So basically our lights at this point are just a beacon to say, this is where you need to head. This is, you know, follow the light, but don't have an expectation that the entire sidewalk or the entire parking lot is, is going to be lit up for you. And I like to end um, with this slide because I think we've all seen uh, this very, very famous Van Gogh painting of the Starry Night. Uh, he painted this uh, based on the time that he spent um, actually in an asylum uh, while he was suffering from depression. Um, but he painted this uh, based on his time in southern France. And if you were to go to this same spot in southern France today, uh, you would not have use of the night sky anywhere close to this. And so again, it's uh, it's really a shame that we're, you know, that collectively we're missing out on so much that's out there. Um, the night sky, it's, it's more than just, you know, knowing about how stars form or, or really getting into the science of it, which is great. And I uh, encourage folks to do that. It, the night sky is a great thing to learn about. Um, but for me personally, what I have enjoyed more than anything is simply grabbing family and friends and getting a blanket and heading down to the river or even my own backyard and just enjoying it for what it is. Um, even if you're out there with kids, just playing a game of connect the dots and hey, you know, can you imagine how they possibly, ancient cultures possibly who saw a hunter in that constellation. Um, it's just really fun to, to just partake and, like I said, enjoy it for what it is and, uh, and just know that it's a, it's a resource. It's part of nature, uh, what's going on in the, in the celestial uh, heavens up there. And so um, there are some really cool apps, uh, free apps, in fact, um, that I have found really helpful. Um, and you can, you know, search for them. I can't remember the exact names, maybe Skyview. And, and there's various ones. Um, but for someone who's a novice and, and maybe just wants to get outside and, and just kind of poke around the night sky, that's a great thing uh, is to, to get a device and to take it out with you. And you can point this at the night sky and it'll show you what you're looking at to kind of help get you started. Um, or like I said, try to make it up to the Buffalo and, and join us for one of our night sky programs. Uh, we have a really fun, engaging time uh, uh, doing that with the public. And finally, uh, again, um, I've talked a lot about the park, but the one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that, um, and some of you guys may be aware of this, but uh, this, this year marks our 50th anniversary as America's first national river. Um, and it wouldn't have been without the uh, the residents of 
the local area, Northwest Arkansas specifically, Kansas City, uh, the Ozark Society, and all the folks that fought to um, make this uh, a National Park Service site and to protect it for future generations. And so as Arkansans, uh, you guys are extraordinarily lucky to have this in your home state. Um, and we invite people, obviously, from all over the state to come and spend some time at the Buffalo. But we see people from all over the country and even other parts of the world that come to this park um, to enjoy the waters, to do, enjoy the camping, and, and now to enjoy the night sky. Um, and actually, uh, in October, the weekend of October 8th and 9th, uh, we uh, are planning to do uh, a, a full moon program. So again, stay tuned uh, to our park website for that. Um, but that that is planned for that uh, October 8th, 9th weekend uh, at the Tyler Bend Visitor Center, or I'm sorry, the Tyler Bend Pavilion area uh, specifically. So with that, um, I know I kind of covered a lot of ground, but I welcome any questions or comments from the audience. That was awesome, Casey. Once again, I, I learned more and more. No problem. I want to do more and more. But um, can you tell us a little bit about the park amenities? Do you have like cabins? Yeah, that's a great question. There we do. Uh, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, graced the Buffalo River back when it was uh, a state park in the 1930s and early 40s. Um, and so at Buffalo Point, there are cabins in the park uh, that are available for rent. Uh, those are operated through the Buffalo Point concessions. Um, and so you could look those up. And then there are also a lot of private cabin rentals in the area, all the, you know, all the local communities within the watershed. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for lodging. If you're a camper, we have a lot of tent camping specifically. Um, and for those with campers um, that like the amenities, especially during these uh, hot spells that we're going through, uh, Buffalo Point uh, Campground uh, has electrical and water amenities for folks. So I strongly recommend a reservation. We stay pretty busy, um, but those options are available if you want to come on up and spend a night with us. That's awesome. I have a brother-in-law who's a real star fanatic and he lives in Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. Has to travel three hours away from his home to see a dark night sky and does it regularly because he's so fascinated by it. So I think it's great. Going to try to get him up to Buffalo. Okay. Well, good deal. And you know, the thing about light pollution is that it may seem overwhelming, you know, again, where there are a lot of uh, street lights out there and, and gas stations and all these things. Right. But the, the beauty of light pollution is that it really can be solved with the flip of a switch. Um, again, like you saw, when we have wide scale power outages, that's all it takes to open people's eyes to what they're missing out on on a, on a normal night. Um, and so, you know, I just think that the more engaged we get with our communities and our, our local businesses, the more positive things that can come out of it. Again, a lot of it just comes down to education and just right. recognizing that it's a thing, light pollution is a thing that's impacting all of us. It is a thing. It is a thing. Hey, Paul, do we have a winner? Do we have any questions? We, we do. Um, and I do want to make one final call for audience questions while I read that off. But um, uh, that was a, definitely a, a top three best slideshow that we've had. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, that was awesome. Very informative. So thank you. You put a lot of uh, effort in that. And I hope you convince some people to, to see the light. Yeah, or not. <laughs> exactly. Well, and if nothing else, hopefully I've piqued some interest for folks to go learn more, uh, especially in your guys' local community. You guys live in a much larger community than I do, um, and especially with the lakes there. Like you said, Judy, I'm sure with, uh, with the amount of people that I've even seen move into my area in the last couple of years, it's concerning, uh, you know, what what is some of this new building going to do in, in the growth in our community? So... Well, it's, it's not only that for me, I, I look out at, at, you know, my view, which is beautiful, but there are so many like fiesta lights or whatever you want to call them and, you mm -hmm. know, lighting up their yard. And I'm like, where are my bats? Yeah. <laughs> they don't come around much anymore. And it, that's really sad because, you know, mm -hmm. the less bats, the more mosquitoes. So you no. know, look at all that it's a cycle circle of life. It is. It is. And yeah, these are things that you notice even on a small scale in your own backyard. Yes. Yep. 
All right, a couple questions from Paige. Uh, a simple one first. Uh, can you give us the website again, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I probably neglected to do that. So the website for the Buffalo is uh, www.nps or National Park Service dot gov slash b u f f. And uh, there's a tab on there about the night sky. There is also a tab on there to our calendar of events and the programs that we'll have going on. And, and we're continually adding to that as the summer goes on. So, so keep an eye on it. All right. Thank you. And uh, question, another question from Paige on Facebook. I know you discussed pollinators, so I assume this also affects bees. Uh, so bees are, uh, at least the bees we have here in the Ozarks, uh, they are daytime pollinators. However, there are nocturnal bees in other parts of the world uh, in more tropical areas. And so, yeah, light certainly, um, if, if you were to visit South America, uh, you know, that might be something that you would hear about is the fact that, that, that there are bees that pollinate at night. Uh, specifically, uh, the plant that gives us chocolate is pollinated uh, by, by nocturnal bees and flies. And so, uh, so that's important to me. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but uh, yes, but, but bees, uh, nocturnal bees uh, in other parts of the world are vital to pollination and, and something that folks need to be concerned about. Uh, excellent question here from Alan. If anyone wants to go on a nighttime drive, what is the dark sky closest to hot springs? Uh, as far as a designated site uh, by the International Dark Sky Association, the Buffalo is going to be your closest bet. I think the next closest place is going to be some, I think, Kentucky. Um, and then, of course, there are lots of places out west, you know, where, you know, Judy's brother uh, finds some, some dark night skies. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that you can't go out and find small places where you get uh, a, a dark night sky. So I would check, you know, around the Washita Mountains. Maybe there are some some parks that are or some places rather that are far enough away from the, the busier towns that you get nice glimpses of the night sky. There are also uh, astronomy groups. Uh, there's a Central Arkansas uh, Astronomy Association. Um, and so that would be another resource there. Uh, had, I think they're headquartered out of Little Rock, um, but I know they do programming and they're real big on education throughout the state. So that might be another place down your guys' way to check out uh, for, for good spots to hit up down in South Arkansas. And isn't there some kind of annual astronomy festival in Oklahoma to... Uh... Oh, there very possibly could. There are, are certainly a number of, of star parties that go on, yeah, all over the place. And Oklahoma would probably be a pretty good place to take in the night sky as well. So so to be designated a night sky, what was the rating? Does this have to be a one? Uh, so not necessarily. There is a gold and s silver and uh, tier system. And so the Buffalo... Uh, <laughs> We are not like Death Valley. We're not that dark. Um, a lot of, again, sites in Utah follow fall under that gold tier status. Uh, we were able to hit silver tier status here. Uh, so we're, we're not necessarily a one on the Bortle scale at all. Uh, we're more in the two range. Um, but all things considered, um, we're, we're pretty pleased with that. And what would you expect, like, the Washita Mountain would be in that range? You know, I have not. This is embarrassing. I haven't been down there to observe the night sky. Um, I would hope that you guys are similar in a lot of ways there in the Washita's uh, to us. Um, and again, uh, the the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society, I think, would be able to really uh, hone in on that for someone who was interested. I know they've they've worked with communities all over the state, um, you know, trying to help them dim down their their own municipal lighting and things. Um, but the Washita's is something that I've, I've heard them talking about. Um, and so not in terms of, of looking necessarily to get a site designated. I don't know if it's quite that dark, um, but I know that there are folks from the Little Rock area that head out that way to do observing. All right, well, final call for questions or we're gonna flip a coin between Paige and Alan. Uh, Judy, do you have anything? <laughs> no, it's been great. Uh, Thoroughly enjoyed it at the conference. Thoroughly enjoyed it tonight. Uh, the, the last thing I would like to remind everybody is about the Rain Barrel Workshop, which is June the 25th at Family Park. Thanks. From 10 to 11. 
So um, that does sound like a really good, fun time. And I have a rain barrel and goodness knows it has remained full this spring, but it's 40 gallons and that's 40 gallons. I don't have to get out of the tap and it's 40 gallons of non-fluorinated water that I can water my plants with. So it's all a really good thing. And I think everybody needs to get a little, it's the little things that you do that, that add up to a big, big, great picture. If we, if we all do just one or two little things. Excellent. All right. And uh, Casey, anything, any events you guys have going on you'd like to uh, like I said, check our check our calendar of events because yeah, I'm I'm constantly adding night sky stuff. So uh, so keep your eyes open if, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, find the uh, the Buffalo Point Ranger Station. Give me a call there, um, and I'd be happy to to go over some specifics of what you can expect if you uh, want to come up for a program. And she'll answer the phone. I personally will answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now time to pick a winner. And it is Paige. Congratulations. All right. You're going to have some fun shopping. Uh, Paige, that, that, your gift card to Hot Springs Sod and Turf will be available at the library in the morning. So you can come pick it up. We open at 8 o'clock. And yeah, we'll be, it'll be there. And Judy, what do they have to look forward to next month? Once again, it's it's a third part of our Homesteading in a Modern World series with Jamie Wilkerson. And we're going to be talking about food preservation because we talked about growing it last month. And hopefully it's growing. Mine's not. But um, anyway, there's going to be all kinds of really good information. I mean, it's not just canning, but, you know, there's pressure canning. There's hot water bath canning food dehydration, freeze drying, and she knows a lot about all this kind of stuff. So I think it'll be a really fun program to tune into. Third Wednesday of the month. That's right. All right. And uh, since that's the third part in the series, like I said at the beginning, you can go back and check out the first two parts uh, on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, all of the previous Master Gardeners programs are recorded, uh, not not just a homesteading one. So there's a lot of interesting topics. Last month we had snakes of Arkansas, which was great. And, and one of our master gardeners was nearly bitten by a copperhead. And oh, to what Belinda said last month, the copperhead struck, but did not release any venom. Probably would have on the second strike. But man, I'll tell you, I, I learned an awful lot. I love this program. I think the library is an awesome sponsor for not only know it to grow it, but so many other programs that talk about hot springs, our history, what's going on downtown. They've got bluegrass jams. They've got chess. They've got, I mean, I can't even go on and on about how great our library is. And there's so many great things coming up in their future. It's very good. A, a, a very fun time in the next couple of years at the library. And tomorrow we actually get to give them their award for being friend of the master gardener. And so they will be honored at our meeting tomorrow. So that's very exciting for us. So that's all I've got. And I thank everybody for joining and thank you, Casey, very much. Oh, thank you for having me. All right. And thank you everyone for watching and thank yeah. both of you, everyone. Take care. We will see you next time. See you next time.